thank you again for being here. And we're happy to hear from Olia Weekly, Tucson Audubon's Applied Conservation Manager. And I, before I give the microphone to her, I just want to say that Tucson Audubon's mission is to inspire people to protect and enjoy birds. And so thank you all for being part of that. Your presence here shows your commitment to it. And I know many of you volunteer or give financially, uh, involved in so many other ways with what we do. So thank you for that. Some of you even gave as you registered for this talk. So thank you so much. That's what uh, enables us to do all this cool work. And Oli is going to share with us right now about some of that. So thanks, Oli. Of course, thank you so much, um, everybody, for being here. I know this topic is um, maybe not the most uplifting, but it's very important for our mission that Luke just stated and for us to continue to enjoy birds and to have those uplifting moments. So I appreciate you being here, and I expect that you will come away from this being inspired to protect the birds in your own homes, as well as spreading the word and telling your friends, neighbors, family about being a good neighbor to birds and other wildlife. So thanks so much, Luke. Um, let's see. So you should be seeing my screen here. I'll start with a little introduction. My name is Olia Weekly. As Luke mentioned, I'm the Applied Conservation Project Manager here at Tucson Audubon. So it's a fancy title, but what does it really mean? Well, it means um, on the ground efforts to conserve and protect birds. And at Tucson Audubon, I get to do a little bit of everything, but mainly I'm in charge of the Nest Box program and our community science efforts, including reducing hazards to birds, such as Bird Safe Buildings program and Death Pipes project, which we will cover in this presentation. I also have the privilege of helping Jenny with surveys for IBA priority species and target protected birds, such as um, yellow-billed cuckoos and willow flycatchers, things like that. Uh, by the way, in this picture, I'm holding a baby Lucy's warbler in my hand. There it is, zoomed in. It's only six days old and super tiny. We're banding them in this situation. So love them so much. I think it's safe to say that everyone here appreciates birds in some way. A lot of us spend a lot of our time, effort, and money uh, to attract them to our yards. We provide feeders, we plant native plants, uh, and those plants provide food, shelter, safe places to nest, safe places to escape uh, from predators. We also install water features, as we all know that that's so important in our desert environment here. So these are all factors of a bird-friendly yard, but this also brings great responsibility uh, for us to protect the birds and their um, well-being because they are found closer to humans in buildings and other environments that have been altered by humans. So birds interacting in habitat and just passing through deserve safe passage. This presentation is in partnership with our Habitat at Home program, which you all may know. It, this program guides you in your journey to create wildlife-friendly yards by selecting the best native plants that will do well in our area, that would provide the most um, value to the wildlife that we're sharing this environment with. So if you would like to make your yard more bird-friendly and reduce threats to them, look into our Habitat at Home program. It is a certification program that offers a lot of really good resources for specific to our area. It's not easy being a little bird. They face many threats, too numerous to cover in a one hour presentation. Instead, I'd like to focus on threats that Tucson Audubon is actively working on a subset of them, uh, those that have a community science component, 
a component where you all come in by helping in your own yards, your own properties, or by reporting back to us what you see in an urban landscape or a wild uh, a wild landscape that has those threats. So in this presentation, I will cover bird window strike prevention, pesticide use awareness, as well as our efforts to prevent uh, drowning deaths as well. So window collisions are actually one of the biggest human caused uh, bird deaths in North America. 365 million to a billion birds die from window strikes in the US alone. And more and more birds every year are found near buildings because our urban centers are continuing to expand. And we also create these habitat pockets in our yards as we should because birds really rely on those habitat pockets. But like I said earlier, this comes with great responsibility to keep birds safe. We've all seen an image like this on a window, a ghostly imprint of a bird. Usually a dove leaves an imprint like this, but not all window strikes leave a mark. In fact, many people don't even realize how often this happens in their homes. In fact, more people have started to notice this now since so many more are working from home and they're hearing those thuds and they're seeing those birds that have collided with the windows. Many birds die on impact and get carried off by hawks or cats and they leave no evidence of what happened. So sometimes we don't even realize it happened. And window collisions kill some of the most fit of the population, not just the weak uh, of the gene pool. So this risks weakening the gene pool, which is not a natural selection. Windows are dangerous to birds for three main reasons. Transparency is the first one. Um, birds are not familiar with the concept of glass, uh, making them think they can reach whatever is on the other side. And people are familiar with the concept of glass, and we still walk into glass like this, glass doors that are clean and transparent, so we can't really blame birds, right? I've definitely done that. Um, reflection is another reason. On their own, double-paned windows are very reflective, and now window companies offer UV protecting film, and it's designed to decrease home cooling costs, but it creates an even more mirror-like effect like you can see in this photo. Birds see this as perfectly normal habitat or sky that they could fly into. And again, they cause a collision that they may not recover from. Light is another factor. Uh, whether indoor or outdoor lights are confusing and disorienting to migrant and resident birds. This is a picture of a direct way birds get caught in the light beams. This is a 9-11 memorial to Twin Towers that projects strong beams of light into the sky of New York. They trap thousands of birds that are on their way in migration. They uh, fly around in circles in these beams of light and then end up crashing to the ground exhausted. But thanks to the local Audubon chapter, they now turn off these lights intermittently to allow the birds to keep flying. Um, many don't realize this, but most of the songbirds migrate at night and it's a big problem. And high rise buildings are contributing to this problem by leaving lights during peak migration which cause confusion and lighting in residential homes also contributes to light pollution of our skies. Uh, birds migrate by stars and moonlight and artificial light can cause them to wander off course and toward dangerous nighttime landscapes of cities for example. Um, every year birds become uh, confused and collide with illuminated buildings and towers. So are there, uh, are there factors that affect window collisions? Yes, uh, we notice more window strikes during spring and 
that's because more birds are interacting in their breeding habitat. This also includes clumsy juveniles. And what is especially sad is that if parents perish, then most likely their brood in the nest dies too. That way the mortality is even greater in an indirect way that's often hard to measure. Window strikes can occur at any time of day, but more, more likely in the early mornings and evenings because that's when birds are most active. Um, homes that are located in high migration corridors can have more window strikes. For example, near riparian areas in our state of Arizona. When comparing high rise and low rise buildings, it's actually the short residential buildings that see the most window strikes. And that's because we work very hard to create bird friendly yards um, or even simple landscaping. We should not be discouraged from doing that. Birds rely on our habitat and our backyard habitat quite a bit. So instead we should just make windows safer to birds. And that is where you all come in. We want to reach out to as many people as we can and urge them to take action in their homes. Everyone in this audience today is a bird appreciator. You are probably already aware of this issue, but we're also going out to the public and educating everyone else that may not know that there are solutions that they can take at home. And we're here to guide you through it. We offer a way that can be fitting for anyone to prevent collisions, different price points, different aesthetic um, preferences. We offer DIY tutorials and budget-friendly options for anyone. The start is simple. First, you want to examine your windows. Start with those that are directly across from theaters and water features. Continue with windows where you have seen or heard a window strike. Look for evidence that, but do keep in mind that not every window strike will leave a mark on the glass. And of course, windows that reflect habitat and sky are very dangerous and should be treated. Ideally, we would work our way around the whole house to prevent window strikes. So if two windows are directly across from each other, it creates a sense of fly through path for birds and should be blocked with external blinds if you have those um, or internal ones, unless it creates a mirror like effect. So a sunshade roll up like this uh, keeps your house cooler and of course creates a solid uh, appearance to the window but you are still able to see through. A study by Dr. Clem showed that feeders placed within zero to three feet of a window are actually safer because birds cannot gain enough speed when taken off to do any damage against the window. And they also have a clear target to land on when flying into it. So it seems like that's a good option to have. Um, the other thing you can do is making windows visible to birds. That's the number one best thing to do. Even if you don't move the feeders, this is the best thing you can do. Those are, there are many, many different methods out there and they all are different with different people's aesthetic preferences in mind. But the general rule is that you want to keep the designs two inches apart, which would protect even our tiny hummingbird species from thinking that can fly through. All designs must be visible from at least 10 feet away. If you're doing stripes, they must be at least one eighth of an inch wide and dots at least one fourth of an inch in diameter. The two by two spacing is still the most important factor. All this information is available on our website and you can reference it when you're ready to take action in your home. I will link all of it in our follow-up email as well. So don't uh, worry about trying to memorize it or make notes. International Dark Skies Association has these guidelines for residential lighting. All light should have a purpose. For example, illuminating a path. 
all light should be targeted. It shouldn't be just out there like a lighthouse uh, flooding everything around with light. That causes light pollution that disturbs circadian rhythms. It's just not good for anybody. On the image on the right here, you see huge beams of light glowing in all directions. Instead, what they recommend is shielding the light downwards onto the ground where the entryway is, where it's needed. And it's recommended that you use lower strength warm lights that reflect less into the night sky. Dimmers and motion sensors also are very helpful to control when the light is on and it will save you money too. So win-win for everybody. Also wanted to show you a couple examples that we've used before of making windows visible to birds. The first one is a copian bird savers. This method uses hanging cord, string or ribbons of at least one eighth of an inch wide space two inches apart again. This is a great option that go, doesn't adhere directly to the window. And if you're renting or otherwise cannot put anything directly onto your windows, this is a perfect option. They also sway very nicely in the wind. Uh, they also call them Zen uh, curtains. So for that reason, you can make your own by following a tutorial online or you can order them on the link provided. Um, I've made these myself from paracord. It's really easy. It's just kind of like macrame, making knots and cutting string string to length. So um, very easily done, and they can be done to whatever size window you have. You can also create using. You can also use tempera paint or markers or bar soap, things like that to create designs on your windows. These are temporary, fun, very kid-friendly. You can be super creative. You can switch up designs every season for holidays, whatever your heart desires. Some Habitat at Home participants even hired local artists to create a fun design on their windows. That's what I would have to do because I'm not very artistic. If I was doing something with paint or markers, Mine would be lines, or I've used a stencil before. So those are really good options for those that might not be as artistically inclined. And But it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, whatever you want in your own house. They're easily removable with window cleaner, but they do stay up under regular rain conditions as well. The other one is called Kaleidoscape. It's a company that makes special window film. It's kind of like a bus wrap where you can see out easily. And it actually saves on cooling costs for your house. You can print any type of image um, or have them plain colors. This method goes directly onto your windows. If you've been to our Mason Center, you've seen the two uh, bird images that we put up. That's Kaleidoscape. You can make it your photos. You can upload whatever you like. They also make tape and we sell it at our nature shop and online. We carry the white tape and the clear one that creates a frosted look. So these are the two examples here. These are great. Again, they last a long time and um, your eye gets really used to these really fast. So. It's amazing. The other favorite of mine is Feather Friendly. They're very much a minimalist, uh, symmetrical option. Also, your eye gets really used to it very fast. There is a method for everyone's aesthetic, and they're all American Bird Conservancy tested and approved. And you don't have to measure out, in this case, every dot. It comes in a tape that you roll out and put onto the window. Um, we sell these at our nature shop again. If you would like to see the installation process for each of these uh, methods, I did make a, a video that goes over the price points, difficulty, aesthetics, how it looks inside, outside, things like that. You can also visit our Mason Center to see it for yourselves. It's on the northwest side of Tucson. 
And again, these uh, resources will be available to you in the follow-up email. Hopefully you've all been inspired to take action at home. But if you do end up uh, coming across a window strike at home, place of business, anywhere else you go, the guidelines are here provided from Tucson Wildlife Center, which is a wildlife rehab here in Tucson. If you hear or see a window strike and the bird hasn't recovered within an hour or it's in immediate danger from um, those stray cats or traffic or a hawk that you know is nearby, throw a lightweight towel on top, uh, gently scoop it up and put it in a box that's lined with another towel. Make sure um, the airflow comes through this box, that it's not completely airtight. Um, take off the little towel that goes on top of the bird and take it to Tucson Wildlife Center for evaluation. Also, if you see a bird fighting its own reflection, it's because they're thinking there's a, um, a rival that they're fighting and it's not their reflection. They're unlikely to get injured in this case, but they're spending so much energy doing this where they have other better things to do. So block the reflection for a few days until the bird moves on. You have to block it from the outside. You can use a plant or a curtain or paper, things like that, but it has to be completely blocked. So to recap, strike proof your windows, spread the word to your friends and neighbors. If you encounter a strike, please, Report it on our website, which will be included in the follow-up. When you report window strikes, we'll be able to see what species are most affected here and which areas need our attention. This includes businesses and commercial buildings. We also encourage you to register for a free program. It's a simple survey that asks you for your methods, what you're doing at home to prevent window strikes, and then we send you a uh, program recognition decal and a certificate of appreciation. Um, so really helps us to know what you're doing, how many of you are out there in Tucson doing this. We also give out free decals at our nature shop. Uh, they come in these kits so that we are bringing down that paywall and making it more accessible to people. Each kit can treat one window with dots that you see on this picture. We've distributed over 1,500 free kits to this day, and we keep putting more out in the nature shop, tabling events, and Tucson Wildlife Center where people bring in injured birds. So I'm going to pause here real quick. This was a big chunk. It's one of the biggest um, causes of bird mortality, so I wanted to cover that in depth but I wanted to see if there are any questions so far on the very first um, section here. Feel free, free to unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you have something you want to put in the chat that I can share for you. Nothing in oh. the chat right now. Okay, excellent. I saw two messages, but they're both from you, so I appreciate it. They're that. both from me. <laughs> yep, that's me. Excellent. Well, um, then... Yes, is there a question? Yes, I was just wondering, um, where is the wildlife um, center that you take injured birds to? Yeah, so Tucson Wildlife Center is uh, pretty much at the end of Speedway on the very east side. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. It's a bit of a drive, but it's because they have to have a big property to uh, care for all these injured wildlife. Um, yeah. Okay. I would give them a call as well because you don't want to be driving out there when they're closed. So it's good right. to call them and make sure that they're open. Uh, I do believe they open at 8 a.m. I think 8 to 5, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to um, go ahead with the next one. We have next poisons and pesticides. And I talk about this quite a bit because I have a nest box program that I take care of. And it's important to me that the owls and the kestrels that we try to help with the nest boxes are not also being poisoned by rodenticides. So please don't use rodenticides. 
they not only kill rats and mice that you're trying to get rid of, but they also kill the wildlife that eat poisoned individuals. And through bioaccumulation, rodenticides builds up in predators that consume those poison carcasses. And this affects um, owls, hawks, bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, skunks, domestic pets. Um, and not only can it cause really terrible deaths, uh, but they can also impair the immune system and cause wildlife to be more susceptible to diseases. For example, coyotes, um, you may have seen some with mange, and that's because of a suppressed immune system as well. And that's when they look really rough and scabby, and that's um, a terrible disease. If you use rat poison, you would be killing owls in the area that are already providing the pest control that you're seeking. Um, they provide it as an ecological service, so it will have the opposite effect. Glue, glue traps are incredibly inhumane. Animals get stuck in these. They die a very slow, painful death over several years, uh, days, sorry. And you may also end up uh, catching unintended victims such as birds and lizards. And um, oftentimes wildlife centers get these uh, delivered to them and they have to use oils to slowly remove the still alive uh, wildlife from these glue traps. Avoid using pesticides, uh, and I mean by that insecticides. Insects are important pollinators and food for insect eating birds. Poisons accumulate in birds that eat insects. Our NAU partners have already been seeing this uh, in the analysis of purple martin samples that they've been doing. And um, that affects their eggs output, things like that. So it's just not good for anybody, even if they don't die immediately. It can affect multiple generations. So depending on your habitat, please consider putting up an hour orchestral box. Uh, educate your neighborhood on avoiding using rodenticides if you're going to do this. And we've actually had really good results by partnering with HOAs that hire us to put nest boxes up in their neighborhood. Um, and they do a lot of education in their newsletters saying don't use rodenticides. And they've already been seeing a major drop in their rodent populations just from having successful screech owl boxes in their property. So those are excellent hunters. They have great hearing. They're designed basically to eat small rodents. Kestrels are also incredible rodent hunters, but they hunt during the day. So they don't often come across the um, rodents. They usually go for lizards and stuff like that and large insects. But it's whatever is most available. So if there are a lot of mice, they're gonna go for a lot of mice. If you need help selecting an appropriate nest box for your habitat, feel free to visit our website at tucsonautobahnorg slash nest box, or you can email me directly with your cross streets and I can recommend a nest box that would do well in your area. Not everyone can have a screech owl like in the central Tucson, probably not. <laughs> Um, we also sell, so yes, we sell our Kestrel and Owl boxes at our nature shop. They're $65 each, um, really affordable because, I mean, lumber really went up. So um, this is actually very good price comparatively from places that you might have to ship it from, and they're really heavy. So also... Consider keeping snakes around. Um, Non-venomous snakes like gopher snakes and king snakes are great at controlling rodent populations. Um, they're not a danger to you. If mosquitoes are a problem, uh, you want to avoid spraying. I think that's more of a problem with people with um, big lawns or people in the east coast or something like that where they spray 
whole yards. But instead, you can do a larva trap by using a bucket, water straw, and the mosquito dunks. The mosquito dunks are a special type of bacterium only affecting the larva of the mosquitoes, so everyone else is safe. Uh, if you Google this, there is a great tutorial online. I just did one myself yesterday in my backyard. Uh, you can also email me, and I'm happy to provide that tutorial for you as well. Next up, we have death pipes. Death pipes are basically any uncovered vertical pipe, and they're dangerous to birds and other wildlife because while looking for a place to nest, hibernate, roost, animals will become trapped in these open pipes. They're unable to climb the smooth surface of the pipe and spread their wings. So they eventually die very slow death. And um, cavity nesters are usually the most likely victims because they're, that's what they do. They're looking for cavities. But not always some of the likely species are those cavity nesters, like I mentioned, bluebirds, flycatchers, um, woodpeckers, but also sparrows, shrikes, kestrels, and owls. Um, they're also cavity nesters. In addition to birds, there's lizards, snakes, small mammals, um, even insects will fly or get in one of these and not be able to come out. In this particular image, you can see a flicker on the top right and then a lizard on the lower left, uh, on the upper left. And it's amazing because it's really hard to estimate how many birds and other animals perish in open pipes because you can't see them. Um, they die and uh, are not found for often many years until those pipes are removed or you start looking inside of them. For example, uh, in, 20, in 2009, Audubon, California removed a 20 foot tall pipe from an abandoned irrigation system. Uh, it was in place for 50 years and they ended up finding hundreds of birds and animals, including kestrels, flickers, bluebirds, fence lizards, all stuck inside of that single pipe. So it's a very much a, a silent killer and a very much a hidden um, cause of bird mortality. These pipes are often used as fence posts or to anchor a gate, for example. That's the most that I see are gate posts. They can also mark a boundary or a mining claim or mark a roadway like the one in the middle. There's also vent and irrigation pipes that are a danger if they're uncovered. Once you learn about death pipes, you will start noticing them all over the place. And birders like us are often out in wilderness areas. So you have the power to locate these pipes and report them to us. We need more eyes out there looking for open pipes. And uh, <clears throat> we, thanks to Arizona Sportsmen for Wildlife Conservation, we secured a grant from them this year to educate the public about the pro problem, um, being able to identify and come back and permanently cap these death pipes in Southeast Arizona. That's where we need your help locating them. We've already identified quite a few, but we need more eyes on the landscape. If you find an open vertical pipe, please report it to us. On our website, if you uh, forget in the future which website to go to, just email me and I will direct you, direct you to the form. We will ask you on that form where this pipe is located and how big it is. And we also ask that you temporarily cap this pipe with objects at hand until we can get to them and cap them permanently because first we'll need to acquire permission from the landowners 
And then, of course, I don't imagine anyone saying no. So we will come back and do so in a permanent way. And here's a few examples of how you can do it. If the open pipe doesn't serve an obvious purpose like ventilation or irrigation, so there's no purpose for it to stay open, you can cap it temporarily with a large rock that you place on top, or you can stuff it inside of the pipe. You can use trash, you can use a large stick and stuff it inside. If you're working on your own property and you need a more permanent way, you can use wire mesh and a clamp over the pipe, or you can use a cement cap. You can go out and buy a special PVC cap that is the perfect size for the pipe you're working with. The possibilities are endless. Just make sure that they're not easily movable by wind or animals and you're in good shape. If you need a ventilation purpose for your pipe, uh, there are many special screens that are on the market to help. For example, the screening on the chimney on the very right. The next issue we have is animals large and small drowning in water features. So we all know that the best way to attract and help wildlife in Arizona is by providing water. Well, there are some dangers that come with it um, and it is a good deed, but there's some better ways to do it. So a number of animals from ground squirrels, lizards, bees, bats, birds, of course, can drown in bodies of water, no matter the size really. When animals fall in the water, they swim around the edge, often trying to find a little step or a rough surface to grab onto, grab onto and climb out. If they can't find that, they end up being exhausted and drown. Some things you can do at home to help is having a shallow water dish with a rim that the birds and bees can grip onto. For example, this little Lucy's warbler is, can easily stand on that little rim. It can also be um, wider, but grippy, so you don't want anything too slippery. Or you can put rocks inside a deeper dish to create a similar effect. So they're protected and they have somewhere to stand. This uh, is also important for quail babies. They're clumsy, they're, they don't know how to get out of a, a deep dish. So something with rocks or shallow uh, dish is best. I know that right now we're having a lot of evaporation from shallow dishes. So you can put one of your irrigation spouts into this water dish. So whenever your irrigation comes on, you will refill this water dish as well. To prevent bees and other insects from drowning, you can make an edge or a complete separate dish that's full of rocks and only a little bit of water. So water is not over the rocks, but rocks are over the water. And that way their little feet can easily grab onto uh, the rocks. They can climb closer to water safety. Uh, if they end up in the water, they can also get to a rock very easily and fast. Butterflies also love moist soil or what we call a puddler. And you can make your own by using a shallow dish, fill it up with sand and then keep it moist. And the butterflies will use it to drink water and um, absorb minerals as well, which they, they need. This applies to pools as well. Here in Tucson, many people have uncovered pools. Wildlife like lizards, snakes, bats. Bats are often skimming the surface uh, to get a drink and they end up falling in sometimes and unable to get out. Uh, this product called Frog Log is a great option to prevent this. It floats on top of the water and has a little ramp that goes to the edge of the pool. And that way animals can climb up or rest on the edge of it. Um, I also would recommend checking your pools often and the little 
uh, filter traps as well that you, uh, wildlife can get caught in. Uh, a quick rescue is always um, more successful. I would recommend at least one of these on each side of the pool to make them the most um, successful, most ac accessible to small creatures. Uh, we've had people send us pictures of animals being rescued on these little ramps, so it's so nice to see when that happens. We now have a partnership with this company, and if you go on this link and purchase a frog log, a portion of the proceeds will go to Tucson Audubon. I've honestly given these as part of a housewarming gift when I knew that they had a pool. So um, some people just don't know that there is an option for a solution and they think that it just comes with the pool. Pool ownership, but these are unnecessary deaths and there's stuff we can do about it. If you come across uh, a water trough or on, on rangeland, for example, while birding, or if you own property with these deep water troughs, we suggest installing metal mesh for wildlife to be able to cling on to, or you can put a large branch or a piece of wood into the water trough if you're just out and about birding, and that's your temporary solution. Uh, I've also seen some awesome little ramps that float on top of the water. So no matter um, the water level, you're always, there's always a little shallow edge that birds can drink from uh, very easily and safely. So I left plenty of time for us to talk about some of the other options. If you have ideas, I love sharing different ideas and being creative about it. Together we can make a difference. I will provide all the links and resources in this follow-up email with Luke. Feel free to ask me questions now or via email. Please use me as a resource. I am so happy to help you to find an, a solution and please report those death pipes and dead birds so we can prevent those unnecessary deaths. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so I can see you're all there you are and see if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Olia. Yeah. Any questions for, for Olia that you guys would like to ask? All the questions have been answered. Yay! <laughs> Either that or it's just like, oh, it's a lot of information. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about the follow-up email. We might have the uh, make a, a record for the most links ever in a follow-up presentation email. I'm going to try not to do that. A lot it's of the right. pages have the links in them, so it's just linking to those pages. And um, But yeah, you know, we just want to get that information. So yeah, and uh, arm you with the resources and reporting forms as well. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah. I mean, if we're really like... Uh, uh digging into our mission to inspire people to protect and yeah. enjoy birds like that protect part is it's key so yeah. oh, it looks like there is a question in the chat uh is there a particular type of sand we should use for a butterfly puddler so i've never seen anyone list a type of sand i use just the play sand that you can find for like six bucks at lowe's um I imagine that even if you use the sand or like that sandy soil um, from your own backyards and just keep it moist, that that would be just fine as well. Um, they're just looking for something that would be safe to put their proboscis in and getting minerals from it. So I think it would not matter what kind of sand. Good question. Cool. I haven't heard that word proboscis in a long time. <laughs> it just came to me, but if I was trying to remember it like on the spot somewhere, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, a few thank yous here. And uh, if if you guys want to unmute yourself and give Olia a, a, a verbal thank you, that's always fun to hear too. And then we'll we'll wrap up and just want to tell all of you thank you for being here and being a part of Tucson Audubon. 
Yes, thank you so much for being here. Um, go out and spread this information even further. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. See you guys later. Have a good day. Thanks, Olia. Bye.